dear Zed, if I just share my screen, can somebody see that? We can see it just fine. It's perfect. Yeah. Good. Excellent. Right. So. So if we rock and roll, I should say any questions or anything of that nature, feel free to shout out, interrupt all that there sort of stuff. Where are we? Go for a little bit of a pointer, user pointer. Um, right. So um, for those of you that do not know me, um, James McCachern, lecturer in Beef Systems. Um, I also historically was a beef and sheep farmer as well. Um, and in terms of research, mostly interested in performance within animal production systems, fertility, health, um, disease diagnostics, and then slightly into, into carbon emissions intensity as well. Um, and it kind of relates back to what Ed has been talking about previously in terms of random forest plots. So this data set, just as a very generic overview, the problem that we've been faced with here um, is called PRISM 2030, which is very close to prison for my liking. But anyway, PRISM 2030, um, we have essentially went out, or we haven't went out, but someone on our behalf has went out and collected the carbon emissions intensity of 350 beef and sheep farms across the United Kingdom and various parts of Ireland. OK, um, and I'll come through to the carbon emissions in a minute. But what we have basically got is we have got the emissions associated with the agricultural practices that are going on that farm. Um, I'm going to focus in on beef elements today, but in terms of the, the, the wider data set, it looks more at um, arable enterprises, sheep enterprises, all of the works. Now, it becomes in terms of the potential predictor variables that we've got in here, as Ed pointed out previously, we've got about you know, north of 500 predictor variables, if we just start with an overall summary. And the data quality is questionable in places, lowish in others, non-existent in some others, and quite crap in some ways. But on the other hand, there's things that some farmers will struggle to hide regardless of what's typed in. Now, in terms of greenhouse gas emissions, et cetera, et cetera, for those of you that are not familiar, um, you may be familiar with some of the press associated with the carbon emissions intensity of beef production systems in general. And it tends to focus on the methane that the eructate doesn't come out the rear end, as most um, popular press seems to get that slightly wrong, um, come, is belched out the front end. Um, biologically, that methane is actually produced from the breakdown of low quality fibre and its upregulation into high quality protein. OK, um, I mean, I would seriously question we could spend days and in fact weeks on uh, carbon footprinting in itself. Um, what is the value of animal production systems? Are they important? What is their social value? Should we be carbon footprinting them at all? Um, I would probably classify uh, water pollution and biodiversity loss is bigger issues than carbon footprinting, but hey ho, here we are. Now, all of this um, association with carbon footprint, global warming, carbon emissions intensity means that we have a target of net zero by 2030. And, uh, hence, leading on into this project, and are there any ways of lowering carbon emissions intensity? Um, what is the theoretical minimum? How much are we potentially capturing? Now, a lot of people don't really get what, <laughs> to try and break down the data set, the problems with it and the potential ways of analyzing it. Um, in terms of a carbon calculator, <sighs> especially with regard to a beef production system, 
What we tend to be, and it depends on the calculator that you use, on the methodology that you've got underpinning it, whether it's tier one or tier two, generally a carbon calculator, whether it be AgriCalc or Cool Farm Tool or whatever it may be, tends to work sort of on this principle. So you have your animals, okay, rather happy moo bears, okay. When we produce the feed for those animals, whether it be a forage as we have down here or as a concentrate, you will emit carbon. And the carbon emissions associated with feed production tends to be the fertilizer and the manures applied that grow that feed. As well as that, the, you also have I would call it kind of a deforestation tax. So if you buy something like soya that may originate from South America, they will put a land use change carbon footprint calculated over 20 years most of the time on there as well. So you've got all the carbon that is emitted. Now, if we think about application of fertilizers, that's predominantly nitrous oxide that we're emitting in that case is a greenhouse gas. We feed that feed to our animal. They then produce methane, which is the major, um, a major component of our carbon footprint of either a beef or a sheep system that's emitted by our animal, comes out there. So we have feed production, we have our methane. Um, as a quirk to the system, if you fix nitrogen from the atmosphere, so any of you that are into clover or nitrogen fixers, you actually get that for free. So that's essentially free carbon that enters the system and hence the drive to have legume or legumous crops available within um, production systems. Now, if we move away from animals for a minute and move into, um, say, arable production, the majority of the carbon footprint of a loaf of bread, about half of it actually comes from the fertilizer. So a lot of arable crops, their carbon footprint is coming from the ag agronomic um, properties that go with it. Now, if we feed an animal, we get slurry and farmyard manure out the other end. When we store it, we will then release carbon, um, a little bit as methane, but also as nitrous oxide coming off during the manure storage component of that and during its application back. Um, so all of these, whenever you do a carbon footprint or someone's talking about the carbon footprint of a an animal production system that tends to be all the elements that are actually included. Okay. Um, and when we look at this data set, the overall carbon emissions intensity in terms of carbon equivalents or global warming potential that we've got coming off is the sum of all of these characteristics. Uh, the other thing that you can consider is, are we sequestering some trees? Soil could be an emitter, could be a carbon capture, depends what's going on. Now, we generally have some underlying principles, and this got me into trouble on the BBC, because unfortunately, the more efficient an animal is, um, and in beef systems, we could call it reduced days to slaughter would be the technical term, the less pollution that that animal will cause. Also, the less land that that animal will occupy. Um, and the same goes for dairy, it goes for beef, goes for sheep, all of them. Generally, as we improve efficiency within a system, we will reduce the carbon emissions associated with that system on a per unit basis. OK, now those are the principles. Um, the problem is whenever you intermix those principles with an inaccurate system um, that has some caveats, data collection from farmers, you tend to get a little bit of, well, I don't know, a shit storm that comes through in terms of issues that we can have with all of this. Um, so in our case, we've had 350 farms carbon footprinted. This is the gener generic theory of how that carbon is being calculated and added together. And what we are essentially after is we're after predictor variables that the farmer can change that will lower their carbon footprint as well as their potential influence. And the theory would be here that you, as you reduce days to slaughter, that's the effect that you get. Okay. Now, what are part of the problems with this? Well, 
One of the first ones that comes to mind is that beef can be up to a 30 month long production cycle. OK, so 30 months, little baby calf is born. Um, 30 months later, it enters the food chain. OK, um, it can vary anywhere from 12 months of age up to 30 months of age. So our average age at slaughter at Harper, for example, would be approximately 13 months of age. The reason for that is because we have a very low carbon footprint. So the carbon footprint at the future farm beef unit would be around top 1% of the country in terms of performance and emissions associated with it. Very different for what we're about to look at here um, in terms of the mean for the industry and the range across different farms that you've found. But one of the issues we've got is we've got a 30 month long production cycle, but the carbon footprinting or data collection fees only accounts for 12 months. So you could have a scenario whereby all of the majority of the feed for an animal is purchased within these 12 months. OK, you get lots of methane emissions during this 12 months, but the animal is sold in the next year. So by definition, the carbon footprint of this farm looks astronomically high in one year and astronomically artificially lower in the next year. OK, um, and that's one of the major issues that we have specifically with beef animals in these production systems because the system is so long. Now, in the financial world, you would quite simply depreciate that asset across a number of years, say 20 years to build a building. That's not what we've got going on with carbon calculators in their current form. So we have that as added variation in this data set. Um, and compound that with the data collection period extends over the invasion of the Ukraine. So quite simply, what you could have is a lot of farmers merrily jogging along, um, farming their animals, invasion of the Ukraine, concentrate prices go through the roof, feed prices go through the roof. They have multiple years of animals available to them. So what do they do? They run down to the market and sell them all. OK, so you can have one year that looks exceptionally good, quite simply because they've sold all of their animals. OK, and that's a major, major issue that I've got with the theory overall benchmarking within it. So comparing one farm with another and trying to work out what effect things farmers can do are actually having in terms of consequences here. So. If we take it to one of the subsets of the data that we have available to us is a lowland spring calving suckler cow. Um, for those not familiar with beef production systems, a suckler cow is quite simply a cow that has a baby calf and its only role is to rear that calf. That calf enters the food chain. Uh, the main alternative would be dairy beef, where you have a dairy cow, she produces a calf, the calf is removed and enters a beef production system versus the cow that continues around through milk production. OK, so we're starting off with um, a lowish quality data set. We've got hundreds of potential predictor variables. We have... Um, a calculation methodology that we are unsure of um, because we know the tiers that may have been used within um, IPPC, but we don't know which individual calculation um, was actually used or there's nuances in there. So, for example, methane might be calculated on dry matter intake. Off the top of my head, I can think of seven different calculations that will calculate dry matter intake for you. So you've got all these nuances floating around in there and all this sort of dirt and mess going on. Um, so I looked at it and... Um, the basic principle that I wanted to get to here is how can we take all this variation out that's coming from farmers selling different animals at different times and all of this various behavior that's going on that is adding um, variation to the system and making it more difficult for us to work out what will actually lower your carbon footprint. 
Now, at this stage, this is just a very superficial starting analysis, and we'll probably expand it to the overall data set. Um, but I focused in on suckler cows, um, which is, we would call that an enterprise level. So I took my suckler cows out. So of the 350 farms, we had 68 farms with suckler cows at the enterprise level. So I was trying to work out what's going on within this subset before going any further. Now, as I've just said, one of the biggest concerns for me is have we got farmers offloading large numbers of animals or buying up large numbers of animals or telling lies, which is the other third option that they could be up to. Um, so initial analysis identified basically where I started scoping this from is the principle within a lowland suckler cow system is that every cow should produce one calf per cow per year. OK, that's generally their biological limit. So if it's a lot lower than that, something is going on. And if it's a lot higher than that, something is going on. So, for example, if a farmer is selling two or three calves per cow, that would probably tell me that they're selling for multiple years. They've just offloaded everything. And you can see that's what's going on. So the range between um, how many animals were sold per suckler cow was not 0.42. So half a calf for every suckler cow, all the way up to two and a third. So some farmers are magically producing two times the number of calves that they should have. So in other words, we have got lots of this um, wheeling and dealing going on. We have got people bringing animals on. We've also got people moving animals off. Um, so the next question in my head is then, how do we actually account for that? Because um, how are we going to draw out things that the basic conclusion that you come to under that scenario is that farmers should just sell all of their animals and they will be net zero? Yes, they will. Well, no, they won't be net zero because you still cycle through um, any farmed land. But yes, if they sold all their animals and all their land, technically they would be net zero. That's not what we're after here. So to try and take account of this movement, I, cal I developed what Ed would call a feature in here. So I wanted to try and develop a mechanism that would indicate proportionally whether those enterprises are increasing in size or decreasing in size so that it can be set to zero. OK, so what I did is I created this little calculation. So I best I express the net movement of animals on or off as a percentage of those mated, which is kind of like an average. So in other words, animals in, so moved on or born, minus the animals which are sold or die, um, divided by the average number of mating cows that a farm has. And what that's basically calculating is it's telling me Percentage wise of the mean, are we increasing or are we decreasing? Is it a positive number? Is it a negative number? OK, and what I was trying to do is, is trying to create a feature which allowed me to take out this sort of farmer behavior element that's going on here in terms of mass movement of animals um, and the carbon associated with them. So what I did is I created this feature. I then introduced that feature and the explanatory, um, potential explanatory variables into a random forest plot to try and rank them all. OK, so that's what we've got over the page here. Don't take too much account of that. You can see all these things that might potentially affect the carbon footprint in this massive data set. You know, red diesel, how much diesel is the farm using per cow? How much feed are they buying from elsewhere? Calving percentage would be a, a measure of fertility. OK, so how fertile they are. Basically, the more fertile you are, greater number of calves, lower your carbon footprint. Now, what you can see, and this is the um, this is um, in ranked order. You can see that by far the most important factor was this feature that I had created, enterprise balance. And you can see that we, you've got 31,194 in terms of importance relative to the next one down, which is 2000. Now, when we introduce that into the linear mixed model, 
the enterprise balance accounts for 55% of the variation in the data set. So the most of the variation in the data set is actually where all of the animals are moving, which is not the end of the world, because it means we can then focus in on a model which allows us to analyze some of these other variables of interest. So daily live weight gain, quite simply, how quickly does an animal grow? OK, um, how fertile is that herd? Are they buying in lots of feed from elsewhere? Is that feed polluting? You know, is it palm kernel meal that's came from Borneo rainforest deforestation? Or is it soybean meal, which is um, Amazonian deforestation? So what have we got going on there? So we developed this. Now, the way I've used this random forest is to basically give me an indication of which explanatory variables are the most important so that I can then start to build um, a general linear regression model and predict outcomes. OK, see what effect things have. So sequentially, I used this as a decision making tool to put these variables into a general linear regression model. OK, James. Um, yep. Can I ask just a quick question on the previous slide? Fire away, Ed. In the, in the conversations we had before today, um, I thought of a question to ask, which I, I don't know. I, I know how I dealt with it for um, my much more general and less focused analysis than you're presenting. But I just wondered, uh, you mentioned you created a few features, but I wonder if you imposed any selection on all of the potential variables that you fed into the uh, random forest model. For example, um, did you did you select a subset of all potential predictors when you ran the random forest model? I did. I it's probably a can of worms. You don't have to open now, but could you give us a an idea for my own reference about how many models? Is this all of the um, predictors that were in your model? It is, Ed. I restricted it. Bear in mind that I kept meaning to go back and keep doing, the <laughs> doing it again. <laughs> um, I restricted it at the time to physical performance, I'm almost certain. So the, yeah. I, the ones that you have here, Ed, I'm almost certain I did that looking at them all, that I restricted it to physical performance. So what I would have classified as physical performance that may have had an effect. So I did introduce that constriction in there. I gotcha. I gotcha. I think I just want to put a pin in this outside of this meeting that uh, we go back and talk about this maybe together for the greater analysis, because maybe an alternative to this would be to put in all possible variables to the random forest and then choose that subset of predictors that you you focus on after the initial ranking happens and and exclude the ones you know you're not interested in because i think that's what they've asked me to go back and do with my um like say less focused analysis in here than yours but uh let's discuss out of here i just wanted to clarify that thank you oh yeah 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 um yeah that's what i put in that's uh, from memory that's what i did that way round dead i should say yeah and I'm welcome and comments from anyone on this. Um, I definitely would not say that I'm 100% certain of any of the decisions I made. Um, and any way of improving it would be much appreciated. Um, so, yeah, I res we've restricted to the areas of physical performance. Um, we've created a random forest plot. We th I then used it as a decision-making tool to start to feed variables into a general linear regression model. Um, I have to say that I was my model of best fit in this case was not how much variation I could account for. It was it was how much variation I could account for um, with the minimum number of variables that explained the greatest uh, proponent of variation in there. So in order of importance, net movement of animals. So where animals moving on, where animals moving off. The next thing which came as a bit of a surprise was how quickly bulls were growing. 
So a bull is an entire meal. Um, they tend not to be used as much in the beef industry anymore, quite simply because you have bull taint on meat, which is a historic where testosterone adds toughness. You also have a you also have an association with danger. Um, we do have one bull down in the beef unit at the minute, if anyone wants to jump in with them and test that theory. Um, third one, purchase concentrates per suckler cow. So how much feed are they buying in? Fertility, which kind of makes sense. The more calves you have, the lower your carbon footprint. Um, where are we using any home growing bedding? And then how big that suckler cow is. And altogether, that model accounted for 80.6% of the variance in the data set. So if we consider 70% to be where we ideally want to get at or above, um, with those five, five sole explanatory variables in relation to the hundreds that we started out with, we get all the way down to 80.6, all the way up, sorry, to 80.6%. Now, one of the potential comments from the funder and others is that just because a variable is not on there does not mean that it does not affect the carbon footprint. So in other words, just because farmers are not doing something that would improve, if it doesn't exist, we can't pick it up. So an obvious example is age at first calving. Um, the theory would be that if you calve an animal younger, it produces earlier, the carbon footprint of the farm is lower. But whenever you go out to collect that data and you ask a farmer, when do you calve? They're going to say 24 months. So every farmer says 24 months. Every row in the data set says 24 months. So by definition, A, it's probably not accurate because their 24 months is probably not 24 months, but B, we do not have enough sensitivity within this data set to be able to pick that up. You'll notice here that most of the things that are on here are things that farmers can't hide. So it's difficult for them to hide when animals move on or off. They cannot hide how much they sell because that comes back as a physical number. They also can't hide how many calves they have because that's registered, and they also can't hide whether they use straw or um, whether they uh, buy concentrates. So you notice that the things are on here are things that either through um, quality assurance or legal requirement, they have to record. Um, now, what does that mean? So what James. I did with this, yep. There's just a question in the chat about, um, could you just say a little bit about your dependent variable, what it is? Um... Oh, right. Sorry. Yeah, I can't believe I missed that off. Um, our dependent variable this time round is for this will be um, whole system carbon emissions intensity. So we're talking about the additive effect of the carbon from feed, the carbon from enteric, the carbon from manure, and the carbon from fertilizer application. So whole system emissions intensity. So in other words, the carbon footprint at the farm gate of that beef product. So that's what and we're really- And that's it's per kilo of product, is that right? On this, it is per kilo of product, so it will yeah. be per kilo of dead weight. Yeah. Um, Yep, so it'd be per kilo of dead weight. Um, so what we basically did is we've got this model that predicts that the dependent variable is how much, what is the carbon footprint of our beef whenever you pick it up in the supermarket effectively, or the farm gate carbon footprint. We then wanted to know, okay, so what, what are the crap farms? What's their number like? And then the good farms, what's their number like? So what's the top 25% and what is the bottom 25%? Um, benchmarking is typically what we would call it in agricultural production systems. So how good is your performance versus someone else's? Um, and we also did a little bit of a sensitivity analysis of if I change average daily gain by say not 0.1 kilograms per day, What's that going to do to my carbon emissions intensity? So to the farmer, A, what variables should they target changing? And if they change them, what response are they likely to get? As, 
well as that, what performance is actually possible? Because one of the great unknowns um, and one of the great debates whenever it comes to carbon emissions from animal production systems is actually what the carbon footprint is, because there are lots of um, assumptions made in the carbon footprinting of different systems across the globe. And the typical number for a work global system is very, very high. Okay. Um, now, for all of this, because we had created this feature, we set the net movement of animals in and off at zero. So in other words, if your net movement of animals is zero and you don't get this benefit of flogging them or you don't get have to pay a carbon tax of holding on to them, what, what is your actual carbon footprint coming in here? Okay. Now, so the first thing is the sensitivity analysis. So in other words, we've taken our, I've called them, Key performance indicators is technically what you would hear them called in, in agricultural terms. If you're doing farm business management, we talk a lot about key performance indicators. Um, and then the whole system, carbon emissions intensity. Um, so in other words, if we change, so I've got the mean. So this is the mean for the entire population, that 68 farms, that's the mean. Then if I plus or minus it, what happens? What's the percentage change in my whole system emissions intensity? Um, bull average daily gain, the mean is about 1.5 kilograms per day, um, which is very fast actually. Means 1.5 kilograms per day, and every time that changes plus 0.1, your system emissions intensity drops by 2.5%. OK, now the overall mean for the entire population whenever it's zeroed is 31 kilograms of CO2 equivalent per kilogram of dead weight. OK, so 31 kilograms of CO2 per kilogram of dead weight. To put that in perspective, the carbon footprint of the Harper Adams beef production system is 11.05. So ours is three times lower um, than the mean for this population that we have being presented. OK, so ours is three times lower than this, um, which is actually quite good because it means we're probably in the top one percent, if not um, higher than that again. Notice that. Again, uh, the thing that got me into trouble. Uh, <laughs> The earlier an animal enters the food chain, the lower the carbon emissions intensity. OK, again, fertility, fertility coming in there. Basically, the more the more animals you produce per suckler cow, you get a minus three percent for every extra two, two calves you have per hundred cows. Um, bedding is a funny one. Because of the way bedding is calculated, the carbon emissions associated with bedding as storage as opposed to other manure storage systems is about 100 times higher. So by definition, if you use bedding at all, your carbon footprint um, goes through the roof. So James, one of the way, yep. Someone has their hand up, um, Tom. Uh, yes, Tom, yeah. Um, I think doing similar things in the dairy sector uh, and thinking about how you select your performance variation uh, and thinking that those numbers ought to be a constant numbers of standard deviations away from the mean. Because that's that's the sort of range that the that farmers can do in the population, in the community. Um, we've seen some in the dairy sector where people say, oh, if you have an extra lactation for your dairy cow, um, it makes a huge difference. But to get an extra lactation out of a dairy cow is extremely difficult and very few people are uh, one lactation ahead of anyone else. You see what I mean? Yes, I get where you're coming from, um, which is why I've selected these to be within, do you get where I'm coming from? It's why they're within very, very narrow biological constraints. Yeah, yeah. Do you get where I'm coming from? Yeah. Um, How do those express in terms of standard deviations away from the mean uh, um, for, for that variable? 
they're actually incredibly small. So, for example, um, I don't have the standard deviation off the top of my head, but the range for bull average daily gain would start about 0.9 and go all the way up to 2.3. So that's one of the other questions is whenever we're looking at this data, how do we express that variation in relation to the mean in terms of what is actually plausible? Um, so, yeah, I 100 percent get where you're coming from in that one. So and it, the next page, um, what I'll actually do is flick forward. So what I've essentially done here, Tom, this is a top 25% versus the bottom 25% versus the mean. Um, so you have essentially for each parameter, I have taken the top 25% level of performance and entered it into that, into that, um, into the model to get what the hypothetical carbon footprint would be. Um, and if, the they're, if they're performing badly on all five factors. Yes, yes, yeah. in theory. Um, now, the one that will probably draw your attention is the top 25%, which is the one that jumps out at me and the one that Carl has questioned me on in the past as well. Um, and for that, the, um, basically, we've got the same thing going on here. So you've got a bull average daily gain of 1.82, which is biologically absolutely plausible. Uh, to, to put it in perspective, the growth rate of our steers and heifers down there is about 1.6, 1.7. So 1 1.8 on a bull, I'll absolutely give them. Purchase concentrates per suckler cow, zero. Now that's starting to look not potentially possible. Um, and the other one, that is that the, yeah. Purchased, purchased concentrates per suckler cow, zero is the one that jumps out at me. But when I look through the biology of that, what I reckon there are farms actually performing higher than that within the data set, which is where some some of the team members want to look at, you know, case study scenarios of what the very best are doing. So, for example, there are farms that are doing more than two kilograms a day. They're doing they're not using any purchase concentrate. And what I'd hazard a guess they're doing is, Tom, that's not seen in here is they're growing barley, milling it and feeding it, which doesn't come up in terms of purchase concentrates. But they're still technically using concentrates. So there's lots of um, nuances coming in here as well. On um, these farms, sorry, is the suckler unit, is it solely suckler farm or have they got other enterprises? Um, they have got other enterprises. So some of these farms have, goodness, multiple enterprises, beef, sheep. On this one, I've restricted it to lowland suckler cows that are, um, that are breeding and finishing. I've, ex I've ex excluded any store production systems um, for the simple reason that you're essentially, you're, you're mixing up a growing and finishing um, purchasing beef system effectively with the suckler cow system. So so that's that's the one of the issues with this data is a, we haven't got the level of granularity to dig dig down that far. Um, the other issue I'd have is because of the way these calculators work is if we do go to that level of granularity, I reckon we'll end up with numbers being input into the wrong system. <laughs> so if you do have multiple enterprises on a farm, I reckon you'll end up with things being allocated the wrong way coming in there as well. It's but yeah, asking him what answer do you want is what the farmer needs to know. Well, that's what I've got. So what what I've got here, Tom, is we've got. I mean, the debate is how we continue these. We've got. What do we know? We know we can have. Um, we've got a mean of thirty one kilograms of carbon per kilogram dead weight. What does that mean? It means that for the UK industry, it's not as low as we maybe hoped for suckler cow systems. That would be the first thing. We know there's a hell of a lot of room for improvement. Some farmers are on 40. Some farmers, you know, through some of these metrics could have that potentially to 20. And we've got best case scenarios on there with that we can identify that have got a whole lot lower again. 
and we've got the potential identification of the parameters that are going in there. But it doesn't surprise me, you know, quite simply, the more calves that you produce and the faster that they grow, <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> the less carbon that you produce. Um, and provided that growth is efficient in terms of feed use, the finances in my head should go the same way. Um, the problem that we've got is that, and this is where Ed's coming in and referring back to the others, is that I don't think this sort of data analysis is tenable. I th we're probably going to have to have a simpler system that considers all of the enterprises together um, going forward. I think where we want to end up is is basically um, what we want to end up with, as you've just said, Tom, is a system whereby a farmer inputs their data and it shows them in a traffic light system areas where they can reasonably improve um, is what we've essentially after or what we would hope for, I think. Um, but yeah, I totally get where you're coming from. It's this sensitivity analysis and how you express it as well as the best case scenarios that are going on there. But the biology for me does work out there nutritionally in terms of what's possible. I would love to know in terms of the very best farms what they are actually doing. I mean, the only strange one that we've got, and this again, generally as a cow gets smaller, it produces less carbon because it's calculated on dry matter intake, which is effectively metabolic live weight. So one of the strange things that you'll notice is that as we go from 600 kilograms up to 704, and as Ed has already told me, this is skewed and needs transformed. So yes, I'm in trouble for that one. Um, but as we go from 607 up to 704, notice how your carbon footprint goes the wrong way. As you get a smaller cow, it should go down. But as you get a bigger cow, your carbon footprint is going down. And what that probably tells me, again, with data and granularity, I reckon that these bull systems are predominantly continentals, which typically have a higher live weight anyway. So you've got, in theory, yes, smaller cow, lower carbon footprint, but you've then got an association of a bull system with the size of the animal. Okay, so... Continental breeds typically bigger, more muscular. We have continental breeds and native breeds in the beef system, if anyone wants to go and look at them side by side at the minute. Um, Angus versus British Blue. So that's probably what's going on in the suckler cow production system. Um, but you can see that we do have hypothetically the potential to at least half our carbon footprint coming in there. Okay, with... Um, so that's the question, is how do we, A, we've got a number, or we're trending towards a number of what is the actual carbon footprint associated with beef production systems. Um, what, in terms of benchmarking, is reasonable across different levels of performance? Can we identify any exemplary levels of performance which are top 1%, top 5%, top 1%? What are they doing? Because as Tom rightly says, there's a combination of factors that go together. So for the um, lactation example, you may have to change breed of cow and number of litres to get those extra number of lactations. So it's, it's the number of... Um, variables, the, how they combine and how they interact. And I suppose the other one is where do we want to get to, to the, with this is we want to get to, I think, a stage where we've got a traffic lighted system which allows us to um, A, define, um, A, consider all of the variation, identify the spread in the most important variables that the farmer can manage and feed back to them that those ones can be managed and altered. So yeah, I think that's pretty much it. But yeah, it's a hey, head scratching problem, a lot of this, particularly in the way it's been collected and dealt with. Don't know if anyone else has any other questions or if I've just been completely confusing and rambling, which probably me is correct.
<laughs> I've got a question, James. I just um, that was very interesting to see that again. Um, but uh, just thinking about this continentals um, question. So is it basically the data showing that the growth rate of the offspring is more important in determining emission intensity than the maintenance requirements of the cows? Is that right? Yes. So in other words, the faster you grow, the more you dilute everything else. In theory, what you want is you want a small cow and a fast growing calf. But what I think we have got here is you have, because we haven't got the level of granularity to dig down there, or I can't think of how we do, what I think we've got going on is we have people with continentals, so large animals, which naturally have a high growth rate. Because of the constrictions on the farming system, they're then finishing them as bulls and finish them in them as quickly. And because they're finishing them as bulls, they have to finish them before 16 months of age. So you've got all those factors combining together to say that if you have a larger live weight growth rate, you are lowering the carbon footprint accordingly, which doesn't necessarily pan out. The other thing you've got is that our live weights, remember, are guesswork. I would say looking at them. I don't think they're all 650, 700, 750, 800, 400. There's some very round number suckler cows out there. Um, <laughs> Experience from the dairy sector would suggest that they radically underestimate weights. You think, Tom? Oh, yeah, yeah. You think? Uh, yeah. I've... Can you get hold of any cull cow slaughter weights? Have you seen that in the data set? No, it's not. That'll just be on. Uh, yes, we may have that. I would need to go back into the underpinning files, but we may have that. It's not so perfect, but it's a better estimate. Yes, I like it, Tom. Sorry, Ed, we're making this more complicated as time goes on. He's left the building. Has he? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll try that. Um, Ed's asked me to sort of say thank you and if um, to round up the meeting at the end, but I think Sarah's got a question, so I'll let her ask that first. Thank you. Yes, thank you, James, for a very interesting talk. Um, so my question was, I was interested to see that you started with the random forest to select your key variables and then yep. you put it into the, the general linear regression model. So I just wondered if you had any comment on, because rand the random forest is non-linear and then you've used that in a linear model. And I just wondered if you wanted to make any comments about that, but also whether you'd thought of Putting them all, well, you're going to do what Ed discussed, wasn't it? Put them all into the uh, the GLM as well afterwards and just see what that comes up with. But I just wondered, um, you know, I, I was interested in that approach to use the random forest first. I have to say, I have to confess, Sarah, I don't know enough about the linear co comment to say anything. My understanding from Ed and the basic principle would be that the idea of the random forest is that if we're starting out with a very large number of random sorry if we're starting out with a very large number of predictor variables what the random forest plot is doing is allocating them in at random to give an idea of what is basically the carries most of the variation to give you an idea of roughly what to start with first um, because you run into a problem where if you have too many predictor variables and not enough, um, not enough farms, essentially, you're not going to get there through a, a 
a process of structurally building one, um, depending on whether you allocate them at random or you build with what you think would be biologically the most important and then go from there. Mm. Um, so I, I can't comment on the linear linearity of it there, sorry. No, it, it's an interesting and seems a really, you know, really good idea. Thank you. Thank you for your talk, James. Really, Thank you. really interesting. Thank you. Um, Sophie. Hi, James. Um, thank you for your talk. Could I just ask possibly a bit of a daft question? Oh, no, fire um, away. When you talk about net movement of cows, um, can I just have a little bit more information on that? So basically, when I say net movement of cows, it's it's any movement on or off. Um, so farmers could, in, in these systems in particular, they can, I mean, if I just go through it chronologically, if you have a cow that has a calf, it could um, die. What they may then choose to do is they could move a calf on to adopt it. So you've got a movement on and a movement off. Historically, some farmers, particularly in Ireland, will actually train cows to take additional calves, which is something that my grandfather used to do. So you can have farmers buying lots of additional calves in at that stage. They might then elect to sell them either six months, nine months, a year, two years, or they may sell multiple ages at the same time. So when I say net movement of cows, it's quite simply the numbers that have moved off versus the numbers that have moved on. Now, the problem with that is their size. And unfortunately, we have no idea of knowing what we know the age of the animals when they moved on or moved off. We know the live weight whenever they went for market or slaughter, but we don't know the live weight when they moved on. Um, so we ideally we want net movement of mass or weight on and off in kilograms, but we can't do it. So what we're effectively doing here is trying to work out um, how how many animals are moving on versus the ones moving off and then just expressing it to, to try and give it more uh, in relation to movement size in relation to the breeding herd. That's where dividing it by the breeding herd comes into. Does that make sense? It does. I do have a quick follow up question, if that's OK. Yeah, fire away. So in terms of kind of um, food systems thinking, so I'm kind of thinking of, you know, those sort of diagrams where you have kind of the food system expressed as kind of like in the as, um, in sort of a systems engineering kind of way. Mm -hmm. Could I ask sort of where net transport of cows then would sort of fit in a diagram like that? Is that a really big question? I'm sorry, James. Oh, no, you just have to, in terms of when you say net movement and food systems engineering, do you mean movement between farms or movement to the marketplace? Um, movement between farms. Movement between farms and food systems. I am not actually. Sh Carl, are you still there? Yep, I Carl. am, but I don't know how to answer that one. <laughs> I don't know the answer to that one. <laughs> The only thing is I'm thinking um, you, got, you have vertical integration and horizontal integration and, and in a way the movement oh, of animals right. between farms is horizontal yeah, prior yeah. to moving further up the chain. I see yeah. where we're – so, yeah, so if it, we, it comes into that. So some of these movements are between farms, some of them are between different enterprises, and some of them are – vertically up the food chain as Carl says into the marketplace so that net movement is not captured here it's not capturing where they're moving to again the ones that are dead will be moving to a place for that to be dealt with so you would if it, in terms of food systems engineering it would probably look like uh, three or four different arrows to lots of different places that I've essentially just added together um, 
and taken away from each other to give an idea at the farm level how it's affecting them. Have you had access to the BCMS database for this? Carl, do you know the answer to that? <laughs> That's the de definitive of, of what's moving where and where it's going. And farmers well, find it very, very difficult to fiddle. Well, I think that's a no, Tom. That's <laughs> okay. Not, not, <laughs> not a, no valid, no cross validation between Prism and, and um, BCMS, no. Yeah. No, we've we've basically had an advisory service collect this. Um, so that's the issue that we've got is um, in terms of that data quality coming through. There are carbon calculators out there, Tom, now that do work off BCMS at a very superficial level, which to me actually makes sense because quite simply, if you know how long they've been there um, accurately, it's quite easy to get to quite a good number. I would have thought. And you know where they've gone as well. And you know where they've gone. Well, know it's first or horizontal. Provided whether they're registering them on time and doing things like that. Well, the penalties for not doing it are quite high. So <laughs> even the grottiest farmers tend to do it. <laughs> I have friends now that work in trading standards and my mind is blown by the things that go on. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> In, in this world. <laughs> so yeah, Sophie, hope, does that does that make it any clearer? Yeah, it, it does, thank you. I was just kind of curious because um, I know there's another project, I think called Fix Our Food. Have you come across that before? No. Yeah, and they're sort of, they're building like a dashboard to calculate um, the carbon cost of different products. Yep. So yeah, I was just interested to kind of hear how like the between farm calculations could relate to something like that. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. We have got, I mean, especially in a beef system that, you know, that 26 month old animal is effectively a carbon store that is moving through the system with considerable ability to um, change the balance of any one farm. Uh, well, if it, if it occupies 55% of the variation in here, it's quite astronomical. Um, and you compare that to something like a dairy system, a year round calving dairy system, where you'd assume, provided they're not rapidly increasing or decreasing in size, you'd assume that it would be more, um, less volatile, sorry, in terms of year on year changes. Cool, so yeah, you. awesome, Sophie. Awesome. If we've got no more questions, I might wrap up the meeting just uh, to stay on time. I'm sure if um, anyone has any more questions, James will be happy to answer them at some stage. Um, thanks very much, James, for volunteering today and giving us a great presentation. It was very interesting um, to hear. So. Yeah, thank you very much. And then just quickly to um, finish up. As a reminder that next week, Claire is giving a presentation and then the week after is the Koja Dojo Telford Station. And then um, Ed is always keen for volunteers. So if anybody would like to volunteer for any future sessions, drop Ed an email, drop me an email and we can sort that out for you. Um, but thank you everyone for coming and thank you again, James, for presenting. Cool. Thanks, James. Yeah. Thank you, James. Cheers, Thank guys. You. Bye. Cheers, Thanks very much. Thank you, James.